Hello students, in this video we'll construct the Laurent expansion for a function which is holomorphic on an annulus. Let's suppose that f is holomorphic on this annulus over here. I'm going to center it at zero, so it's holomorphic on the set of point complex points z, such that z is in modulus is between r1 and r2. So that's an annulus, right? Okay, so I'm going to make up some notation for this. This is saying that you're holomorphic on the annulus with inner radius r1, inner outer radius r2, and centered at zero. I'm going to do everything at zero, so I'm to keep putting p's everywhere. Okay, so in other words, this is what does this region look like? So in other words, here's the complex plane. There's the real axis. There's the imaginary axis. Okay, and so the function is holomorphic. So there's my I'm going to make r1 relatively small. So there's my r1 r1, and then r2 to make it very large, I need, need to put an intermediate intermediate radii in between those two things. That's my r2. And the function is holomorphic in this uh, in this annulus over here. So this is the annulus that we're going to consider. So you're holomorphic in this, this ring over here. That's the annulus. And now we claim, then, f of z is equal to the sum n goes from negative infinity to infinity of a n times z to the n. And where were these numbers a n? Where a n is 1 over 2 pi i, the integral over a circle c, centered at 0 of some radius, which we'll specify later, of what? Of f of zeta over zeta to the power n plus 1 d zeta, where rho is specified later. Okay, so these are the Laurent coefficients. And so this expansion is called the Laurent expansion. Notice it's not a Taylor expansion. I'm going from negative infinity to infinity. So this is called the Laurent expansion. This is a Laurent expansion. Okay, beautiful. So how do we prove this? Well, here's the idea. The idea is that what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw two curves. I'm going to find r There's a circle, and this radius over here is going to be little r1. That's little r1. And then another circle over here of radius r2. In other words, what have I done over here? In other words, I've selected two numbers, r1 and r2, that give me a annulus. They give me two circles inside this annulus, right? So here, r1 is less than little r1 is less than little r2 is less than big r2, okay? And now I know that these certain, I'm going to orient them in the, I'm going to orient one of them this way. So one of them is going to be oriented anti-clockwise. So this, this bigger circle is going to be oriented anti-clockwise. Like that. And the little circle is going to be oriented clockwise, so opposite orientations. Like that, okay? So oppositely oriented circles. Excellent. And now I'm going to fix a point z inside in between R1 and R2, right? So here's a point Z over here. There's a complex point Z. So we're going to let Z let R1 less than mod Z less than R2. So that puts Z squarely in this region over here, squarely inside the larger annulus. Okay, excellent. Now what we want to do is the following. So I'm going to def define, so define a function. G of zeta, okay? G of zeta is going to be what? G of zeta is going to be f, let's be f, not, not g, obviously. So f of zeta minus f of z over zeta minus z. And of course, this function has a removable singularity, right? Because the function f is holomorphic. So this has a removable singularity at z, right? So when zeta is equal to z, you say, oh, I can't plug in z equals z because that's a singularity over here. But it's a removable singularity, right? Because it's a difference quotient and that converges as zeta approaches z, it converges to the value of f prime at z, which we know exists because f is holomorphic, right? So in other words, this function g is holomorphic on the annulus. Beautiful.
So now I can use Cauchy's theorem because these two curves over here are homotopic, right? So we know that I can continuously deform this larger circle, the circle with radius little r2, that can be deformed continuously into the circle with radius r1. So those two curves are homotopic. And the orientation, I actually have to make sure the orientation is the right way. And that's why I've oriented them in the opposite directions over here. So I can continuously deform them into something that gives me zero, right? So in other words, I can continuously deform them into a zero, into a zero cycle over here. And so by Cauchy's theorem, for, by the homotopic version of Cauchy's theorem, so by Cauchy's theorem, And you might have said, well, why did we make that video on a homotopic version of Cauchy's theorem? Because it's a very simple, and of course, you might say, in that video, I said, let me assume that the homotopy is, is, is smooth, actually, right? There's a smooth homotopy. Well, the, the homotopy here is easy because I can just shrink the radius, and that radial function, I can look at, I can look at rho e to the i theta, right? Where rho goes between r1 and r2, that's clearly continuous in rho. It's actually linear in that, in that function rho over there, so that's clearly a smooth homotopy between these two curves. And so I can use that smooth version of the, uh, the smooth homotopy version of Cauchy's theorem. That's a mouthful, right? But I can use the smooth version of, uh, for the, everyone always says, sometimes that I speak way too fast, right? I'm getting excited, so I apologize for that. I get super excited about mathematics, and so I start to talk really, really, really fast. I'm going to try to slow it down, just for you all. Okay, excellent. So by Cauchy's theorem, the homotopic version, we have the integral um, over the circle C0, R1, G, of zeta d zeta is equal to the integral c zero r two g of zeta d zeta. Great. Now what's going to happen over here? So I know that z is outside the circle. So let's write these things out. I'm be very pedantic about this. So this tells me the integral over c zero r one of f of zeta minus f of z over zeta minus z d zeta is equal to the integral c zero r two f of zeta minus f of z over zeta minus z d zeta. Okay, great. Now what's going to happen over here is that this f this is a zeta integral. That's a zeta integral. Now this f of z right lies where? This f of z lies outside the circle of radius r1. So this term is going to cancel out, right? Because when we integrate that over a circle of r1, it's not in the interior, right? So there's no point that's in the interior, so that thing's going to integrate out to zero over the, over the circle of r1, okay? Whereas this thing over here, the f of z is now where? The f of z is now inside that region over there, right? So that will tell me that this thing over this f of z is going to integrate to a 2 pi i. That's just the simple, I have a simple pole over there, right? And so since I have a simple pole, I just compute the value of f of z as 2 pi f of z. Great. So what we have is the following. So this implies, so over here implies that the integral over c0 r1 f of zeta over zeta minus z d zeta is equal to what? Is equal to the integral over c2 over r2 of f of zeta over zeta minus z d zeta minus f of z times 2 pi i. Excellent. Okay. And so now I'm in great shape because now I can just solve for this. This tells me over here that f of z is 1 over 2 pi i. The integral over c0 what? The integral over c0 r2, the bigger one, f of zeta d zeta, zeta minus z, d zeta. Okay. And then what? And then minus 1 over 2 pi i, the integral over c0 r1 of what? Of f of zeta over what? Over zeta minus z d zeta. Okay. That's the Laurent expansion. You might say, wait a minute, there's no infinite series over here. Now we're going to use the fact that this, this Cauchy kernel is analytic. The Cauchy kernel is analytic, so I can expand it in the Taylor series, and so let's do so. So on r2, what do we know? On R2, we know that zeta is bigger than z. So I'm going to pull out a zeta from this integral over here. So I'm going to write this as this is equal to 1 over 2 pi i, then the integral over C0 R2. Then I'm going to write this as an f of zeta over zeta, f of zeta over zeta, no problem there. And then I'm going to write that as a 1 over 1 over 1 minus zeta over z, no problem there. And I know that since zeta is an r2 and z is less than r2, this number over here is less than 1 in modulus, so I can expand that. Great. And then I'll have a minus 1 over 2 pi i. This one I'm going to pull out a z, r1, f of zeta over 
Z. I'm going to pull up the Z now. And I'm going to turn that into a plus. I'm actually going to turn, I'm going to flip the script over there, turn that into a plus, pull out the Z, and then I'm going to put the Z first, right? I'm going to have a 1 over, and then I'm going to have a what? A 1 minus. Uh, now I'm going to have a zeta over Z. D zeta. Okay? Now what do I know? Now zeta resides where? Zeta is an R1, and Z is bigger than R1. So that, is that number is less than 1. Good. Now I can expand, I can tailor expand these things over here. So this is going to be 1 over 2 pi i. 1 over 2 pi i. And then the integral over C0 R2 of what? Of F of zeta. And then the sum, N goes from 0 to infinity of what? Of um, just a 1 over, just a z, uh, z to the power n over zeta to the power n plus 1, d zeta. Okay? And then what? And then, these other terms over here are going to be plus what? Plus 1 over 2 pi i, integral over c0 r1, and then f of zeta, and then times the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity. Now I'm going to have a what? Now I'm going to have a zeta to the n, over here, good. A zeta to the n over what? Over z to the n plus 1, over z to the n plus 1, d zeta. Great, OK? And so now, of course, th that's, that's the exact thing that we want to see over here. Now you might say, how is this Laurent expansion? I pull both those sums out over here. And then what's the only catch, the only catch over here is I can index this sum over here. We're going to index this sum over here, starting at what? I can write that as what? This sum over here is really the sum. n goes from, I'm going to write this as n goes from negative infinity up to negative 1. And then we'll have a what? I'll have a, the, when, I need to have a zeta plus n plus 1, so zeta n plus 1 in the denominator, right? And then a z to the power n on top, z to the power n on top. Let's check. So when n is equal to 0, I get a what? When n is equal to 0, I get a 1 over z. When n is equal to negative 1, I get a 1 over z, and I get a what? And then when n is equal to negative 1, I get a zeta to the power 0. So it works out. So I just re-index the sum over here. So now all of the terms of my sum have a what? Have a power of z to the power n. Check. I go from what? I go from negative infinity all the way up to positive infinity. Go ahead, negative infinity up to negative 1, 0 up to infinity. Check, check. Great. And now what are the coefficients over here? The coefficients over here have to look like this, right? Have to look like f of zeta over zeta to the n. Do they look like that? Yes. f of zeta over zeta to the n plus 1. Check. What do they look like over here? f of zeta over zeta to the n plus 1. Check. It works out. So in other words, this integral expansion over here is exactly the Laurent expansion that proves that this formula is valid. Now, one other comment, as I alluded to earlier, I can, I can modify this formula on an annulus not centered at 0, but an annulus centered at p. What's the only modification that you would do. You would put a p over here, you would do a z minus p over here to the power n, and then over here you'd have a zeta minus p to the n plus 1. That's the only thing that changes, right? So in other words, I can just assume without loss of generality that that p is equal to 0, that would of course turn into a, that would of course turn into a p, and then you have to just shift everything by p units. Of course, the translation is the easy part about working with analytic functions, because if I do a translation operator, it preserves the analyticity, and no, no problem over here. So it's just much easier, it's, it's more compact, I save myself a lot of space, and a lot of marker by assuming that it's an annulus centered at zero. But the exact same argument, it'd be good practice for y'all, run through the exact same argument with zero replaced with p, and then make sure that you understand the reasoning over here. The reasoning over here is basically you're using the homotopic version of Cauchy's theorem, right? And then over here, when z is outside of that circle, right, then the integral of f of z over zeta minus z d zeta gives you zero, right? That's just, of course, because there's no residue there. Now, when z is inside that circle over there, then you actually have a residue, right? The f of z, f of z zeta over zeta minus z is going to give you the f of z times 2 pi i, right? So in other words, over here, that's our second sort of clue about how we're going to use the residue theorem in a more general context, right? And that will help us evaluate all sorts of integrals, on, in particular, on regions where a function is holomorphic outside of a particular point. Because if you think about this, if I let r1 capital go to 0, then you're really on a punctured disk. And so we'll be able to handle poles of holomorphic functions and discuss meromorphic functions using this idea of a Laurent expansion. Thank you very much.